Good morning, Revolution, and welcome to this week. Scott, Scott. I'm up? here. How's it going? Hey, I'm great, man. I'm great. Like uh, so uh, what's it look like this week? What has the uh, Communist Party been up to? Well, what have you been up to? Well, um, you've been up to uh, quite a bit. A uh, brand new article out on CPUSA.org, um, starting off with the claim that Donald Trump is the most anti-worker president in recent memory. Um, I think that I think that merits talking about, it, and I think you're completely right. So, um, tell us about it. Well, I mean, you know, Trump ran on a campaign uh, which was largely directed at the U.S. working class, you know, um, and uh, America first uh, meant making American workers first, uh, the way they marketed it, you know, that was the branding, to use those capitalist terms. And make America great again meant making the American working class great, you know, yeah, rebuild American manufacturing. And right, right. And the uh, inauguration speech talked about the, the forgotten people, you know. And when he was talking about the forgotten people, he meant forgotten white workers. Forgotten you know? white workers, absolutely. And that was the hook, that was the double edge to that, uh, you know, propaganda. And uh, because he did it by demonizing everybody else, you know. So if you were poor and brown and an immigrant fleeing poverty and violence in Mexico and Central America, you know, our country is too full, you know? If you're a, a black and living in Baltimore or Detroit or Chicago, you know, you're living in ghetto infested, uh, uh, you know, rat running around neighborhoods, uh, where you had crack pipes and syringes uh, every uh, two or three steps. Uh, I would invite Donald Trump to visit Prince George's County, by the way, which is a majority black county, and to visit the homes uh, there. You, you see a very different picture, including in most of Baltimore, by the way. I love Baltimore. It's a working class town. I used to visit there. Or like to spend some time in or invited to spend some time in the, the Brighton Park neighborhood in Chicago where I moved, where I lived before I uh, moved here. It was a, a mostly Mexican American neighborhood. Um, right. A lot of um, first and second generation immigrants um, and uh, certainly didn't resemble anything that, uh, you know, that he's, de he's described in terms of either inner cities or, or uh, immigrant communities or anything like that. Absolutely, uh, I visited you. Know, fun, huh? joyful, uh, place. But here's the point, you know, Trump's uh, agenda, the Trump agenda is, has been since he got in office, a consistently hard, super duper hard drive, you know, to dismantle every single protection that the uh, U.S. working class has won in uh, decades of struggle, you know. First, he uh, opposed raising the minimum wage. Then he opposed granting federal workers a wage hike. Then they've been trying to systematically dismantle health and safety uh, protections, you know, around chemicals, around women's rights, around LGBTQ rights, you know, uh, and this through this program of uh, uh, deregulation. You know, he put forward that idea, you know, two for one, you had to get rid of two regulations for everyone kept and it is a systematic gutting of all of these uh, uh, protections. And the main instrument for doing it is the Department of Labor. And the Department of Labor is supposed to be a body that's supposed to protect working people. But this Department of Labor, headed by, what, what was his name? The guy who let the child pervert get off easy, Acosta. Yeah. Um, they, they are now a pro big business uh, department, you know, it's like we're living in animal farm. We, we remind people of, you know, the, the election of a president isn't just about who sits in the Oval Office, it's about who gets to appoint the heads of all these agencies that oversee um, and, and, and regulate almost every aspect of American life. Um, so it's not just, uh, 2020 isn't just about getting rid of Trump, it's 
which it is absolutely about that, but it's also about um, reshaping the whole federal government and, and state governments as well. So Trump is appealing to a certain section, upper, upper section, uh, echelon of the uh, uh, white section of the working class, pitting and, and lower middle class, pitting them against women, you know, African American, Latino, Asians, in an attempt to split the class so they can do what? You know, break the back of the trade union movement. Well, I think there, there are I think there are two things happening. Our, so class consciousness is rising. People like workers know they're being screwed. White workers, right. black workers, everybody. Um, and the, the the Trump answer to this, the way of sort of getting in there, infiltrating, twisting, deforming class consciousness and class struggle is to say there are two problems. Um, first, uh, all these you know, immigrants and crime and, and filth and whatever. And we can just like, you know, build a wall, lock them out, send them home, ban this. Uh, that's one end of it. The other, the other end is the solution he proposes isn't giving power to the working class. It's you need a rich guy to negotiate for you, which is a very, um, in terms of the kind of small town mindset, right? Uh, like you need a, you need a rich uncle who's gonna to go to bat for you. You need a, uh, so he, he wants to be the rich guy that looks out for the, for, for American uh, white workers. And- Yeah, well, he's the, he's the Fox guy, got in the goddamn hen house, that's what he is. And, you know, and so the point that we're trying to make in this article is that this attack on uh, people of color, women and so on is hurting the entire working class. It's not just hurting people, you know, of color. It's hurting white workers, you know, it's hurting everybody. And therefore everybody has a stake in fighting against this because if you don't watch out, you know, your wages are gonna be lower. You're not gonna have no benefits. Your social security is gonna be privatized. And that's, and, yeah, every, so there's, I think that's why they hammer so much. Every time Trump's getting, Trump gives a speech. He talks, oh, the economy is the greatest it's ever been. Uh, unemployment's the lowest ever. We're, and, and people believe this against the evidence often of their own, of their own life. Like, I, I would encourage anybody who's tempted to, to repeat those right-wing talking points about how great the economy, does the economy feel great to you? Does it feel like you're, you know, doing better? Uh, Do they believe it or is it that they just don't care and that some of them are like interested who, in other kinds of things because they- That, that is also true. You know, Mexican-Americans or Guatemalans uh, threatening their jobs, you know. Although let me, let me kind of tell you about a, a conversation I had recently with um, somebody who uh, was a, a very loyal uh, Trump voter in fact, she, she had been a Democrat for a long time, but I think switched to uh, vote for Trump. Um, and so we had a good conversation, like uh, we share a lot of priorities. She's, you know, she thinks that uh, the student debt system is completely unfair and, and a, a burden on working people. She thinks that, you know, um, we should have uh, full uh, paid health insurance for everybody. She She's against, you know, she thinks that billionaires should pay their fair share and in taxes. And um, her point was that, oh yeah, finally we have somebody in the White House who's gonna, who's gonna do that. So in her mind, um, Trump was the one who's gonna go to bat against Jeff Bezos at Amazon and make him pay taxes. And Trump's like taking it to the pharmaceutical industry by making them disclose whatever. So there, there, yeah, there's this, he's, He's doing a, a very slick performance of of taking the side of the working class, um, but the reality is something very, very, very different. So I invite everybody because we systematically go through point by point by point what he's been doing and dismantling all of these kinds of things and what the objectives are, and uh, argue with us if you don't agree. Let us know what you think. We want to have a conversation, you know, because all of us have a stake in this, you know, all of us. And speaking of stakes and stocks, 
The stock market crashed the other day, lost 800 points. I'm glad I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there, there, there's an advantage to uh, to not being part of the uh, Are we, part of the owning class. I'm telling you. Are we on the verge of a recession, Scott? Uh, well, everybody's saying uh, that, or many people are saying that we are. Um, you know, the the uh, the yield curve. So the the, the difference between the the yield on long-term and, and short-term uh, U.S. Treasury bonds has has flipped, um, which is supposed to be an indicator. I am not uh, an economist, so I can't say, you know, authoritatively one way or another. And in fact, most economists can't either, uh, which as we learned in 2008. Um, the point of the of the party has you has been that we're in a kind of protracted crisis of capitalism, um, that it's growing more and more volatile. So we're going to have both stagnation and increasingly uh, violent crises. Um, and that this is, this is structural. So I hope for, you know, and, and since we know that the under, the under capitalism, it's always the working class that ends up paying the price uh, in any kind of economic downturn. Um, you know, I hope for the sake of our uh, uh, of our class that you know we're not headed into recession, which make things even worse. But yeah, I don't know. What What are your thoughts? Well, there's a cyclical crisis, you know, that happens. You know, it's periodic, and <laughs> there has been a quote unquote expansion for the last seven or eight nine years. And um, even though working class people are still catching hell have to work two jobs, you know, to make it. And they say the unemployment rate is lower, but that's a trick because they don't count people who have given up looking at, um, looking for work. And the other thing is that a, a, a big increase uh, in the uh, number of jobs are, are part-time. Yeah. Part -time, you know, they're not uh, full-time. And, and there's a summer up, uptick uh, with respect to that. And the other thing is that over the, the, the very long term, uh, the past, um, I think, 30, 40 years, um, there's been inflation, but uh, inflation, especially in the prices of, or growth in the prices of things that working class people buy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and you can see this, go, just going to the supermarket, um, the price of things like milk and eggs and bread, also the price of healthcare, the price of education, those things have grown, those prices have risen much faster than the price of other stuff. Oh my God, you know, I buy razors to shave my head. You must go and, through a lot of them. And I, no, well, um, I do it every day, you know, I, I, I don't like to stubble, but here's the point, the price has doubled. I used to pay, you know, uh, you know, $14, $15 for a package, the lead sensor Excel. Now they cost all damn near $30, you know? And, and, yeah, that, and people like this is people. This this pressure is real. People feel it um, at the at the grocery store or, or whatever. And um, you know, there there are reason. There's a reason why uh, in 1917, um, one of the demands of the Russian working class was bread. Right? People need to eat, and food's getting more and more expensive. Right. And uh, so we'll see what happens with the. We hope that working people don't suffer uh, because of the fluctuations in the uh, market. Uh, uh, but, you know, capitalism is out of the control of those who manipulate the wealth and those of us who produce it. That's the point, you know? Yeah. And they, you know, the control is, is uh, uh, somewhat of an illusion. Uh, so we'll have to see uh, how things go. Scott, in two weeks, we're going to be celebrating the party's 100th birthday. Uh, I was wondering, uh, what are the two most significant, when you think back on the party's history, things that impressed you or, or that had an impact uh, on the country or the world or even on you? Besides uh, getting married to a red diaper baby. <laughs> Uh, well, I was going to use that as one of them, but damn. Um, so I think, 
you know, I'm going to take it kind of broadly. Uh, and the thing that impresses me and inspires me about the party uh, is the same thing that impresses and inspires me about the works of Marx and Engels. And you know, I was thinking recently, what, what was so visionary about them as, as thinkers, as activists, as organizers, um, even beyond all the, the great, you know, transformative ideas, it was that these were two guys who in the middle of the 19th century uh, were able to look at the industrial working class in Europe uh, a working class that was impoverished, uh, uneducated, largely illiterate, often living in squalor. Um, you know, these were not uh, trained, forward-thinking, developed socialist fighters, most of them. Um, and, and they were able to look at that and they were able to say, yes, this is the force, this is the class, these are the people that have to save the world. Um, and, and, and the party, for me, it is the, the, the only organization that I, I see right now that, that carries forth that idea, that looks at the working class, which is not, that doesn't, you know, idealize and romanticize the working class, that recognizes, you know, that a section of it, you know, we recognize that a section of the working class is under the influence of the right wing, uh, under the influence of, of white supremacy, um, but that looks at the working class and says, this, this is the force that has to save the world. And we have to do what's necessary to, as Mark said, build the workers, organize the workers into a class, shape that force, organize that force. Um, and that's what I love about the party. Okay, so that was one. I'll give you my one and then we'll see if we have any time left. The thing that impressed me and that had the biggest impact uh, uh, was the Little Steel Strike uh, in 1937 which the party uh, helped organize uh, through the Steelworkers Organizing Committee. Um, and Gus Hall was one of the uh, union organizers who, who played a, a pivotal role in that uh, a strike. But that's not the reason. The, the reason is that my grandmother was on the picket line during that strike, uh, which was a very brave thing to do. Uh, considering that there had been violence uh, on the picket line, you know what I mean? And, uh, and that connected for, for me, my grandmother was an African-American woman, the daughter of a coal miner and, and uh, a farmer uh, from Alabama. And it crystallized the connection between the left, the uh, uh, working class revolutionary party and the African-American freedom movement. And, and one thing led to another. Uh, and uh, that tradition was carried on in a whole number of different uh, ways. And if it weren't for that strike and the meeting of those two people um, and, the re and the reverberations around it, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> As my dad met my mother in another strike to integrate the swimming pools on the south side of Youngstown, you know, uh, an American read my mom and a labor militant African American activist from the steelworkers union, and my dad. And so that is what the party uh, has represented and uh, uh, meant for uh, me. Well, Scott, I think we're out of time. We'll have to come back to this issue next week uh, when we discuss this week. I think the last thing that uh, we should say. Um, um, I don't know if I started with good morning revolution to everybody, is that we have to condemn the Trump administration's pressure on the Israeli government, Netanyahu, to deny visas uh, to the uh, two uh, uh, congresswomen, the one from uh, Rashida, what's her last name? Uh, Talib? Yeah, and uh, Yohan Omar from uh, Minnesota. Uh, I understand that uh, the Congresswoman from Detroit is gonna be allowed to the West Bank to visit her, her grandmother. So that's a partial concession, but it's outrageous. It's and, and, outrageous. And, and, and yeah, that the, the, that, a, that the US president would pressure, demand that a, a, another country refuse 
uh, visas to elected representatives of, of the American people, which is in fact a form of disenfranchisement. When you think the people of those districts, um, their elected leaders wanted to participate in a, uh, an event and the president deliberately intervened to, to stop them from doing so. Um, it's terrible. And, and uh, not only that, you know, it is, um, well, what do you expect? Netanyahu came here and gave us, uh, spoke before a joint session of Congress and didn't even- without, Yeah, without Obama, without even asking uh, uh, mm. permission from, from the president, so. Black men still don't have uh, 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 rights that a, a white prime minister of Israel yeah. does not respect, you know? Isn't that what Justice Taney said back in the day and it still applies to these racists. Anyway, uh, we're still fighting, we're still struggling, we ain't giving up, we ain't going nowhere. Happy birthday, CPUSA. Scott, have a good weekend. You too, Joe. And uh, check, out, uh, check out that article, everyone. Uh, Joe, what's the title of it? It's here, it, it's, it's a class struggle in the raw, how, how Trump is uh, attacking US workers, or something close to that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.